1980, today's band was on top of the world, releasing one of the biggest selling rock records in history. And then they had years of dwindling sales. In fact, their next three records drastically underperformed. And with rock bands like Guns N' Roses, Def Leppard, and Bon Jovi coming on strong on the charts, some thought this band's best days might be behind them. But those who thought that didn't understand this group's grit and determination. Rushing toward a new decade, they released one of the biggest rock albums of the time while delivering their highest charting hit ever. A true headbanger with a classic riff, yet today it's been all but forgotten. How could the highest charting song of this band's career become their most underrated, a hit that the band hasn't played live in 32 years? Why did they abandon this song? Find out next on Professor of Rock. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember recording your favorite music videos on Blake VHS tapes, you know, from night tracks or Friday night videos or even MTV, you're gonna dig this channel of musical nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe below right now, click the big red button. I know you'll dig this channel. Also take a look at our Patreon, more content there and it gives us a hand in getting more interviews and keeping good music front and center. So today's story is very interesting. One of the biggest bands ever had the biggest chart hit of their long career. It ignited a big comeback going into a new decade when everything had changed, set them up for another 30 year run, 35 year run. And today the song is all but forgotten. Talking about ACDC and Money Talks. It's a song that made their biggest dent on the Billboard Hot 100. It happened in 1990. But as I said, the song has pretty much dropped off the map. It came from their 12th studio album, The Razor's Edge. But uh, to catch us up to speed, let's rewind back for a sec to the year 1981. Rock juggernauts ACDC were riding one hell of a commercial winning streak. Uh, beginning with 1979's Highway to Hell, uh, smashing all kinds of records with their seminal record Back in Black in 1980, and then keeping the party going in 81 with the release of For Those About to Rock, We Salute You, parentheses. After such a strong start to the decade, things were looking amazing for ACDC in the 80s. However, things changed. That's because ACDC's next three studio albums, they saw a steady decline in commercial dominance. Uh, 1983's Flick of the Switch, 1985's Fly on the Wall, and 1988's Blow Up Your Video. They all turned out poorer sales than the band had anticipated. Solid albums, but they didn't yield the kind of uh, powerhouse rockers like before. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love Who Made Who, and there's a few over there. Who made who? Who made you? But they averaged about a number 20 placement on the Billboard 200 albums chart, which isn't that bad. Compared to ACDC's previous releases, though, it was uh, kind of pedestrian. And with the sudden rise of so-called uh, hair metal, glam metal, hard rock acts in the 80s, the rock charts were filling up a lot of bands not named ACDC. And not only were they stealing the spotlight, but they were also killing it in terms of sales. For example, more pop-oriented records like Def Leppard's Hysteria and Bon Jovi's Slippery When Wet would both sell 12 million copies in the U.S. alone, leaving some observers and critics to wonder if maybe ACDC had passed their prime. Other challenges plagued the band as well, including Malcolm Young's bout with alcoholism. Malcolm would admit that by 1988, alcohol had taken over his life. He said, it's caught right up to me and I lost the plot. Angus was going, I'm your brother. I don't want to see you dead here. Remember Bon? That statement was enough to shake some sense into the guitarist. ACDC had already lost her legendary frontman Bon Scott to acute alcohol poisoning in 1980, of course. Was he going to be next? So Malcolm took a break from everything and he put in the work to get sober. When he returned, ACDC was revving up for a comeback. Entering their third decade as a band in the 90s, you know, music was certainly changing in 1990. 
ACDC came out spitting gasoline, dropping their 12th studio album, The Razor's Edge. No apostrophe necessary. Now, when I talk about hair metal and glam metal and hard rock, I'm not talking about ACDC here. I'm just saying that other bands came into the charts that were hard rock acts that were taken over. Anyway, the album would feature a new percussionist on the drum kit, with Simon Wright taking a position with Dio, the guys turned to journeyman uh, Chris Slade to fill in. Slade had already put together a very impressive resume, which included gigs with Manfred Mann's Earth Band, uh, Pink Floyd's David Gilmore, and Jimmy Page's supergroup The Firm, just to name a couple. Uh, another change that came about with The Razor's Edge was Brian Johnson and his absence from the writing credits. At the time, Brian was working through a very difficult divorce from his first wife, Carol. Uh, the two had been married for 21 years, and parting ways after such a long time was not easy. Racked with stress, Brian, like Malcolm a while earlier, dropped off the map for a while. Uh, this led to the brothers Young taking over the writing 100%. Now, Angus explained, Mal and I thought it would ease the pressure on him if we wrote the words. We've always contributed in the past anyway. Uh, back in the day, we'd sit down, the three of us, me, Mal, and Bon, sometimes four of us with my brother George, we'd have this big uh, shoot-around. We always gave Bon a helping hand in the past. Same with Brian. Because if you have a lyrical idea while you're writing, it can save you a lot of heartache and trouble at the end of the day. Um, so that's what he said. Now, as we continue to break down this story, I do want to thank our sponsor. Now, as we continue to break down this song, I do want to thank our sponsor, Clear. You know, I've had so many great experiences using Clear's nasal care. That's helped my sinuses and kept me 100% through the change of season, and that's usually miserable for me. What's been even more of a game changer, though, is that Clear's introduced me to other great products, including Spry Dental Defense System back here. Spry Dental Defense products will help you achieve a healthier smile for your whole family. They're natural, effective, and dentist recommended. From their toothpaste to their oral rinse, to their mouthwash, to their gum. All the products made by Clear contain xylitol, the natural occurring sugar alcohol used as a sweetener. Xylitol has been proven to block the bacteria and viruses that you don't want in your mouth or nose. It'll upgrade your health and your life. The solution is clear. Click on the link below and leave us a comment on Amazon to let us know about your experience. Get this Spry Dental Defense System today. So this new arrangement of not writing lyrics, it was more than all right with Brian Johnson. In 1995, he told Guitar World that he was relieved not to have the pressure of writing lyrics anymore. Uh, though he was concerned, he was letting his bandmates down a little bit you know, by being so invested in his personal problems. He also felt guilty because he was running out of ideas for what to write. So while Johnson got his personal life sorted out, Malcolm and Angus began you know, hashing out ideas for the upcoming album. Things started to take shape over Christmas at 88, but as the brothers began putting together demos, rumors started to spread. Brian M.I.A., Angus took over vocals, and the gossip columns reported that Johnson had been fired from the band. Even got to the point where Brian's mother asked him if he'd been kicked out of the band. Johnson and the rest of the band just laughed off these reports. They mustn't have heard Angus sing, is what Brian said. He was definitely not in danger of losing his day job anytime soon. Talking about his revamped role in the band, Johnson further elaborated saying, so I didn't write on this album. It doesn't matter with ACDC. You're all together and whatever happens, happens. The Razor's Edge, that was recorded at Windmill Lane Studios in Dublin, Ireland, and at Little Mountain Studios in uh, Vancouver. Uh, and for the album, ACDC went with famed Canadian producer Bruce Fairbairn. He'd previously worked with the late 80s chart dominators Aerosmith and Bon Jovi, amongst others. Given his recent pedigree, the band initially had some concerns that Fairbairn might steer him into a more pop-centric direction. You know, pop hard rock like, uh, like Bon Jovi. But it wasn't long before it became obvious that Bruce was a huge ACDC fan. He had a particular love for their older albums, actually. Uh, once that was apparent, the producer and band really hit it off. Bruce told him the goal was to help him sound like ACDC when they were 17. He loved the excitement, the rawness, and yeah, the lack of production on those early albums. Angus said, Bruce told Malcolm that he didn't want us to change ACDC. He didn't want us to do anything that we'd be uncomfortable with. These days, it's hard to find people who are rock producers. A lot of people say they are, but as soon as you start working with them, they'll push uh, their ballads at you. <laughs> and ACDC was definitely not a ballads band. 
The material for the razor's edge was ready to go when the band arrived in Vancouver, so all Bruce Fairbairn had to do was just bring out the dynamics a bit. And thanks to the Young Brothers' preparations and the minimalist approach, the razor's edge, it only took like six weeks to complete, five and a half, something like that. ACDC would explain that the name of the album came from an old saying that farmers used in Britain, where uh, you'd have a hot, sunny day, and then all of a sudden, off in the distance, uh, black clouds started to gather on the horizon. It was an ominous thing, and that was the razor's edge. They took a, a look around at what was happening around the world, particularly with the fall of the Berlin Wall, and they thought that people were maybe being a bit too optimistic. The guys would say, it's just our way of saying the world's not perfect, and it never will be. The Razor's Edge was released on September 24th, 1990, and yeah, it was a massive comeback for the band. Uh, it revitalized their popularity and went a long way to restoring them to the heights of the glory years. Actually, as soon as it was released, it started flying off the shelves. Within two weeks, the Razor's Edge entered the U.S. Billboard 200, where it climbed to number two. It also stayed on the charts for 77 consecutive weeks. Now, across the Atlantic, the album went to number four in the UK and around the world, it just killed it. Went to number five in Sweden, number four in Germany, number three in Australia, uh, number two in New Zealand, Switzerland, and Norway, and it went to number one in Finland and Canada. Back in the US, the Razor's Edge also outsold ACDC's three previous studio albums by a long shot. It moved five million copies in the US alone. Without a doubt, it was ACDC's strongest album in nearly a decade featured 12 tracks and multiple singles, and it let out the ear-blistering Thunderstruck. <laughs> Became one of uh, ACDC's biggest offerings and an outright stadium rocker. Other singles from the album included Are You Ready, Rock Your Heart Out, which was released in Australia, and today's featured track, Money Talks. So the Young Brothers took some grammatical liberties with the title of the song, turning the phrase Money Talks into just one word. That's okay. I think it looks better that way anyway. Uh, they also may have had Brian's divorce settlement in mind when they wrote this. For example, consider the line, Hey little girl, you want it all. The furs, the diamonds, the painting on the wall. You know, but even if Money Talks did have some you know, personal nuances for the band, overall the song seems to be a scathing indictment of what Angus called the rich and the faceless. A play on the phrase, the rich and the famous. Uh, Money Talks, more than anything, is a takedown of all those guys you know, in expensive suits, smoking cigars, and enjoying their luxury lifestyles. Good old boys club. Don't be fooled by the song's catchy chorus. Money Talks is not a salute to money. Not when Brian sings, come on, come on, love him for the money. Come on, come on, listen to the money talk. Come on, come on, listen to the money talk. It's all tongue in cheek. The tailored suits, uh, the chauffeured cars, the fine hotels, and the big cigars. Fine hotel. They're the trappings of those who want to flaunt their wealth to the world. That wasn't what ACDC was about at all. Despite multi-million selling albums and some serious financial prosperity, one of the biggest bands ever, ACDC never forgot where they came from. They wore their working class roots like, like a badge of honor. And you could see it every time they played. ACDC got up on the stage because they loved what they did, not because they were you know, building a financial empire. It's so hard to imagine that even if they'd never made it in the music business, they'd still be rocking with just as much fire and grit in some no-name dive bar. That's what makes Money Talk such a, a powerful statement. It's written from the perspective of those who achieve success, not on the backs of others, but by paying their dues. The song is a commentary on how money divides us into the haves and have-nots, and how when you embrace greed and lust for power, it changes you for the worse. Now, describing the lyrics, Angus called money the big divider, and he said, in Europe, they think you gotta be born with class. In the US, they think you buy it. It comes with the tux. So it's just our little dig at the lifestyle of the rich and faceless.
You know, with one of the most distinct rock voices on the planet, I gotta tell you, Brian Johnson, he growls, he rasps, and he screeches his way through this song. It's a great vocal. And if Thunderstruck epitomizes ACDC's riff-driven prowess, Money Talk showcases ACDC's hook power to hit potential as the intro guitar riff morphs into an all-out infectious sing-along chorus. So starting on November 2nd of 1990, ACDC sat out on a 12-month, five-leg world tour to support the Razor's Edge. They kicked things off in Massachusetts and finished up on November 16th, 1991 in uh, Auckland, New Zealand. It'd arguably be the most successful ACDC tour since Back in Black a decade earlier. It amassed nearly $18 million in the U.S. alone. One undeniable highlight of the tour was that the band made up stacks upon stacks of fake dollars uh, with Angus's face on them. And then each time they played Money Talks, they rained down the Angus bucks onto the audience. People went crazy for it. This is pretty funny. Speaking about the Angus bucks, Brian Johnson would say about it, I think we get about a million at a time and we just blow it out into the audience. Usually that lasts for a week, a million dollars. Sounds pretty good, eh? Ah, but a million a week? I go through that on tour. I'm just that kind of guy. <laughs> End of quote, I love that. That's a crazy amount of counterfeit cash. I mean, you think about it. They had to have had a, a commission like their own printing press to do all that. Now, incidentally, the fake currency did cause some problems in England for the band. ACDC was slapped with a 2,000 pound fine for illegally depicting currency with Angus's head instead of Her Majesty the Queen on the cover of the single of Money Talks. Kind of interesting. Also on the first week of the tour on November 6, 1990, the band shot a music video for Money Talks at the Spectrum in Philadelphia. Uh, directed by David Mallett, the video features ACDC performing a pre-concert taping before 200 fans and then additional scenes were filmed during the night's show. Uh, the video opens with an Angus dollar burning away to show the man himself rocking out on stage. The video features a fiery performance by the band, which builds until finally, toward the end, ACDC drops a massive money bomb on all their fans. So released on September 21st of 1990, Money Talks reached the pinnacle of ACDC's mainstream appeal going to number 23 on the pop charts on the US Billboard Hot 100. It also did an impressive number three on the US mainstream rock chart, which at that point was their highest charting single on both of those charts. It was certainly a welcome upgrade over their singles from their previous albums. Actually, ACDC averaged about a 27 spot on the mainstream rock charts and they were virtually non-existent on the pop charts on the Hot 100. Internationally, Money Talks went to number 36 in the UK, 26 in Belgium, 24 in the Netherlands, 21 in Australia, 15 in Ireland, 12 in Canada, and it went to number nine in New Zealand. So with its commercial appeal alone, Money Talks seemed to be on a trajectory to become a 90s ACDC staple. I mean, obviously ACDC was never geared towards singles or trying to break into the mainstream. They were always about doing their thing, but the band, or Malcolm at least seemed to be all right with that. Said Malcolm, we never wanted to be a singles band and we weren't trying to be anywhere near pop music, but there are some great riffs that just sing themselves. Money Talks was one of those. But despite its initial popularity, Money Talks would completely go off the grid. For one, it hasn't been a part of ACDC set since 1991. I mean, they really didn't play it after that. Setlist.fm has only 156 performances on record, which places it as ACDC's 41st most played song live. Kind of a low ranking for their biggest chart hit. But that's not the only place that Money Talks has disappeared completely. It's gone MIA in pop culture as well. No movie or TV placements that I know of. No noteworthy covers on record from anybody. So what gives? What happened to Money Talks? Was it blacklisted by the band? It's interesting to compare it with Thunderstruck from the same album. I mean, Thunderstruck didn't make a mark on the Hot 100, did go to number five on the mainstream rock chart, two spots below Money Talks, 
And it was about as popular as Money Talks Around the World, posting pretty similar numbers. But Thunderstruck, I mean, it's been performed at pretty much every ACDC concert since its release. According to setlist.fm, going back there again, total of 715 performances on record, making it the most played of any ACDC song released after the early 80s. And over time, Thunderstruck has become an absolute monster, of course. It's one of the most downloaded and most uh, played classic rock tracks ever recorded. It's been widely used in pop culture. It's played constantly at sporting events around the world. Tons of people have covered it. Meanwhile, Money Talks, it's faded into obscurity. But why? I tried to track down something concrete to explain its demise, but all I could find was a lot of conjecture. Some have claimed the song was just too poppy for ACDC's liking. Others have said that Brian Johnson just didn't like it. Reportedly called the song a stinker. I don't think it's poppy at all. It's a freaking great riff. So does that mean he didn't like singing it or he just didn't like it in general? I don't know. Either way, I have yet to find that smoking gun interview that tells us why. If any of you know more about it, let me know below. I'd love to know. Feel free to drop your insight in the comments. I remember buying this album the week it came out. This song was my favorite for months. I mean, along with Thunderstruck, I thought it was ACDC's best stuff in years. Felt like Money Talks it had that classic ACDC magic that would endure next to their big ones. It's frankly shocking to me that it's been passed over by the band and quite obscure to new listeners. I can't think of many major bands who could go decades without playing their biggest chart hit. But ACDC, they can. They're the exception because they've written so many electrifying, ear-splitting, candy-coated, brain-rattling riffs. Riffs that put them in a completely different universe than their contemporaries. Riffs that make the money talk. Money talk. Hey, thanks for watching. Why do you think ACDC's highest charting hit in the U.S. has faded to black? Very interesting question. Let us know below. Leave us a comment about ACDC, Money Talks, and the album The Razor's Edge. What are your memories of this? Let us know below. Let's have a great discussion. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe below. Until next time, remember, three chords and the truth, my friends. We'll talk to you soon.